Welcome. My name is Charles Nazarian. I'm the president of the Gloucester Meeting House Foundation. And it's my pleasure to greet you to our annual Family Day event. In the past, we enjoyed having kids, parents, and our presenters in the social hall of our beautiful and historic 1806 Meeting House. Like so many activities, we had to change plans to something online, but we hope next time to be together in person. I hope you are ready for some fun because we have a wonderful program today called Pizza, Puppets, Stories, Serpents, and Sea Shanties. Every year, we would show two feature movies, have games and prizes for our partners, uh, partner Pathways for Children, and live sea animals with art projects provided by our partner Maritime Gloucester, plus crafts like making snow people, stuffing white socks and decorating them with eyes, mouths and cats, which was organized by Caleb Friday and his family. This year, Pathways helped us with designing the program and getting the word out to many of you. They do an amazing job in early education that enriches the lives of all families on the North Shore no matter what their circumstances. We are also so proud to partner with them. Maritime Gloucester, and especially Kelsey Bradford, helped this year by arranging for Daisy Nell to sing with her husband, Stan Collinson, about her new coloring book called Moxie and the Whale. Kelsey will talk a bit about whales after they sing. Maritime Gloucester is closed right now, but we hope that when they open this spring, you will visit there and see the amazing exhibits and sea creatures. We have a really terrific show for you today. After Daisy comes Alice Gardner reading from her book, St. Peter's Fiesta. Then Peter Burkrot will thrill us with the story of the Gloucester Sea Serpent. After that, we have a puppet show by Lee Balzer, which is lots of fun and full of meaning. Then Pat Johnson will read the heartrending story called Katie and the Big Snow. And finally, Corey Wren will sing original sea shanties and invite you to sing along. Before we start the show, we have to say a special thank you to Sandy Ronan, who organizes all the events at the Meeting House, including our outdoor summer concerts on the green every Friday evening. And also to Monty Lewis for his beautiful graphics for this event and all of the other ones. You should also know that all the events at the Meeting House are only made possible by our sponsors. They are amazing people who contribute the money that lets us put on all kinds of programs like this for the community. They are the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Essex County Community Foundation, and a bunch of amazing people, Woody Brock, Scobie Ward, John and Jan Bell, Lindsay Coolidge, JJ and Jackie Bell, Michael Bresden and Mary Ann Sherry, the Cape Ann Savings Bank, Robert Martin and Patricia Roach, Leslie Nicholson, Andrew Spindler, Karen Bell, Joanne Hart and Gordon Baird, Jerry Ackerman, Maggie and Joe Rosa, and Kathleen and Peter Vandemark. Whew. That's a long list, but we couldn't possibly do it without them. So let's start the show with Daisy Nell and Stan Collinson. Daisy and Nell, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm going to hold up this cover of a book called Moxie and the Whale. It's a, a coloring book with beautiful illustrations by George Ulrich. And it actually is a rhyming story. And we're going to sing it to you today. I brought my banjo and I brought my partner and best captain, Captain Stan here on the guitar. And beside us is Kelsey Bradford. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about where we are and what this great background is that you're looking at. But Moxie and the Whale is a story about, actually on the back of the book you can't see, but there's a picture of the real Moxie. Moxie is a dachshund, and that's the kind of, some people call that kind of a dog, a sausage dog. He's about this long, and he's a long back dog, a dachshund. Some people nickname dachshunds a doxy. So you'll hear me say Moxie the doxy a couple of times. And we are gonna be singing about whales and a little later, Kelsey will tell you about real whales that really are about between nine and 15 miles right off of Gloucester. And the, the boat in the story is a schooner. 
And the schooner is a boat with two masts, a sailing schooner with two masts usually. And you'll see a lot of those around Gloucester now more and more like they used to in the old days when they were used for fishing. But now they're used for taking passengers out and teaching them how people used to catch fish in the old days on a, a two-masted schooner, like the schooner Thomas Lannan, the schooner Ardell, the schooner Adventure. And I'm pointing because they're right out the window here in Gloucester Harbor. Uh, you also hear me talk about the banks and the fishing banks are a place where the fish are and the fish are and also the whales. So um, you'll hear me say some words. And if you have any questions about what those words are, you can get a hold of us or get a hold of the Meeting House Green and they'll know how to reach me or you can ask Kelsey next time you come down to Maritime Gloucester. So if you have any confusion about what these words mean, just, just enjoy the story and know that it's a little bit made up and a lot of it's true. And here's the chorus and this is how we start. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the whales blow, we all pull together. We're gonna sing that again. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the whales blow, we all pull together. Captain Stan sailed out one day from Gloucester Harbor out to the bay. The schooner was skippered by old Captain Stan. He'd sailed since boyhood from the shores of Cape Ann. A pair of old oars was lashed to the mast, and all of the lines were coiled down and made fast. A long yellow dory on the deck upside down to be used at the mooring to row into town. Often in summer, the captain would choose to take Boxy, his dachshund, along for a cruise. The captain would talk to his little dog friend, telling him tales of the waves and the wind. Moxie looked like a sausage, so low and so long. He looked like his parts were assembled all wrong. He weighed just 12 pounds, and his fur was a mess. Where he had come from was anyone's guess. Moxie had walked down the dock one day, and Captain had welcomed the hungry young stray. But Moxie was not a quiet first mate. You see, he had one rather bothersome trait. He'd bark all the time for no reason at all. It was such a big bark for a dachshund so small. Captain Stan would explain as if dogs understood. So much barking was useless, didn't do any good. Now out on the schooner this fine summer day, the waves and the wind blew west on the bay. So out to the banks the captain set sail, hoping to capture a glimpse of a whale. For that's where the humpbacks got all of their meals, eating their fill of krill and sand eels. The banks supplied them each day with their feasts. It was always a treat to see one of these beasts. And here's the chorus again. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the whales blow, we all pull together. You try that. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the whales blow, we all pull together. Moxie was dreaming of eating his supper when a cool spray of water sloshed right through the scupper. Captain Stan turned the wheel and said, fancy that. Quite a big splash when the seas are so flat. But he gasped when he poked his nose over the rail. For there alongside was a huge humpback whale. Out through that scupper, then Moxie did peer. He bared his white teeth to show he'd no fear. Moxie barked loudly, for in his small mind, he realized the whale was not of his kind. Not a dog, nor a cat, nor a person, this whale, but a creature quite large with a split in its tail and long white flippers, one on each side, and dark as the night was the skin of its hide. The hair was dotted with bumps, then a nose that sat right on top to open and close. That was the place where the tower of spray blew droplets of whale breath into the day. The whale arched its back and away down under, but my 
Doxy the Doxy kept his eye on that wonder. And luckily, too, for soon he did see the blue of a second whale, not ten feet from he. This spout was smaller. Yes, it was another. It was a young whale swimming after its mother. So the whale was a she, and the baby her calf. Captain Stan saw the youngster and started to laugh. Looky there, little Moxie, you can't bark at whales. We can watch them quite safely as our schooner, she sails. Just quiet your bark so we don't scare them off. You just stand by here while I climb aloft. Captain Stan grabbed the rigging and upward he rose to look for the whale to see where she blows. And there's the chorus again. Here it is. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the winds blow, we all pull together. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the winds blow, we all pull together. Moxie the doxy climbed up to his feet and mounted the box captain used for a seat. He stared at the water just over the rail. Waiting to see the next move of this whale. Moxie woofed and then growled as he looked at the whales. His hair stood on end and he dug in his nails. Mother whale and her calf were both by the boat, not moving, just lying there, staying afloat. Moxie stretched his long back to get a good view. Then he barked and bounced overboard onto those two. Oh, Moxie, hang on, cried out Captain Stan. I'm going to save you as quick as I can. He grabbed a long stick with a hook tied on tight and swung it towards Moxie, shaking with fright. The whale and her calf were still floating near. Moxie looked up with his eyes full of fear. He swam to the flipper on the side of the calf and scrambled aboard as if it were a raft. Captain reached down and snagged him just right. He looked at the shivering dog so tight. He held him, that poor little dog, and he retrieved him and brought him up on the boat. And they looked all down at the whales. And Moxie looked back up at him. Moxie looked back, tougher it out, but relieved. Captain Stan dried off Moxie from his head to his tail and said, Now, Moxie, that'll teach you to bark at a whale. We're in the whale's ocean. That's not our backyard. You learned a good lesson, though it might have been hard. Captain Stan turned the wheel and trimmed up the sails. He could see far behind him the blow of the whales. With Moxie the doxy curled up in his arm, he said, now you're safely away from all harm. So here's to the whales. Let them live as they may. Now let's head for home and call it a day. Windy old weather, stormy old weather. When the whales blow, we'll all pull together. Windy old weather, stormy old weather. When the whales blow, we all pull together. And that's the story of Moxie the Doxy, Moxie and the Whale. And he went out for a great adventure one day with Captain Stan. And here is Kelsey, who's going to tell you a little bit more about these whales. So, hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Bradford and I'm the Director of Marine Education and Aquarium Operations here at Maritime Gloucester. Um, if you've come to visit with your families in the summertime, you may have seen me with uh, my volunteers down in the aquarium and we have our touch tanks and all local animals. Um, but something that you won't see in our aquarium is a whale, but we do have some uh, parts of whales here because of our special scientific permit that we have. Um, so the whale that Daisy and Stan were singing about are humpback whales. And if you've ever gone on a whale watch out of Gloucester, that's the most common type of whale that you'll see. They're a species that use baleen in their mouths instead of teeth to catch their food. And so around Gloucester, we have six different types of whales that have baleen that look a lot like this. They're like big combs made out of the same stuff as our hair and fingernails, but they can be found in a whale's mouth. 
And what they do is they take these huge mouthfuls of water and any little sand eels or plankton or small fish that are in that water will get sucked up into their mouth. And then using their tongue, they push all that extra water out, trapping the food inside like a big pasta strainer. <laughs> and they're able to swallow that. Um, so we have the biggest baleen whales around here, which are the blue whales. They can grow to be about 100 feet long, massive, massive animals. And we have the smaller minke whales, which only grow to be about 20 feet long. And this baleen here is from a right whale, which uh, are very heavily threatened. They're quite endangered animals. But luckily, thanks to conservation efforts, we're seeing their numbers rise back up, which is awesome. Um, so besides the bale baleen whales, we have whales that have teeth around here too. So this tooth, massive tooth, is from a 60 foot sperm whale. And those guys will eat things like giant squid and big fish and all those giant deep sea creatures that we hear about. Um, so uh, in Stellwagen Bank, which is kind of like a national park, but it's a national marine sanctuary off the coast here. In the summertime, all these whales come up from the warmer waters in the Caribbean and they feed with their babies and uh, local naturalists know the different types of whales and they know them by name because especially with humpbacks, they have a specific pattern on their tail that can help scientists tell who's who. So we've been able to see the same whales come back year after year with their babies and they'll come up with their friends from the Caribbean and hang out here for the summer and then go back down south for the winter like the geese. They follow the food in the warm waters mm -hmm. and uh, they'll have their calves down there and then travel back up with their babies the following summer. So hopefully you'll get a chance maybe to go on a whale watch this summer or here at Maritime Gloucester, uh, we do plankton toes. So you'll at least be able to see their food uh, under microscopes. And it's amazing that some of the smallest creatures in the sea feed some of the largest ones. Uh, so we're looking forward to a really fun summer. Uh, we hope to see you guys here. And uh, thank you, Charles, for allowing us to be part of this awesome event. It's, it's very exciting. So thank you. So uh, now I'd like to introduce um, Alice Gardner. And um, it's a, a real privilege uh, to do that. She's the author and illustrator of the book, St. Peter's Fiesta, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Alice was inspired to write this book and illustrate it um, after she had attended a fiesta in Gloucester for the first time in the year 2000. Her love for Gloucester is seen in her delightfully col colorful uh, book, which you will now enjoy as she uh, presents it to you. So welcome, Alice. We're so glad you could join us. Thank you. So great to be here. It was fun listening to uh, Moxie and the Doxy and the whales. Don't I would believe that uh, Gloucester really has everything. Uh, so my name is Alice Gardner. And um, I am, live in Beverly, believe it or not, uh, but my heart is in Gloucester. I had a, a studio here for many years and went to the Fiesta for many, many years. It took pictures and drawings and uh, interviewed people and decided on the 90th anniversary that I would uh, finish the book, uh, St. Peter's Fiesta, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Let's look a little bit uh, into the history before we start looking at the book. Uh, almost 95 years ago, actually it's 95 years this, uh, this year, uh, Salvador Favaza, who uh, lived in Sicily, Italy and moved to uh, Gloucester because of the Gloucester seaside town looked a lot like his home, hometown. And he settled here with his wife and 10 children. And uh, he was so grateful for his blessings that he decided that he would make a statue, have a statue made of St. Peter. Uh, and the sculptor in Cambridge made a life-size statue of St. Peter. Now, who is St. Peter? Well, St. Peter was one of um, Jesus's 12 di disciples. He was a fisherman and he was fishing one day and Jesus came along and said, come with me and follow me. And he did. And he is believed that St. Peter guards the fishermen and keeps them safe. So the Gloucester community is very grateful. And every year the tradition is to have a St. Peter's Fiesta and honor St. Peter. So Salvador Favaza started 
this tradition. He had the life size statue, he put it on a platform and he had a procession around town. And now 95 years later, we have St. Peter's Fiesta. And just a sideline, uh, his 10th child was named Sarah Favaza. And she was, was a great um, contributor to this book. And she also loved the Fiesta very much as you can imagine. So let's get started. First of all, can you believe that, which is true, people think that the St. Peter's Fiestas can be even more exciting than Christmas. And that is saying something. So let, let's look at the cover first. When I had, when I was designing this book, I had a, a look at the cover and say, what am I gonna put in the cover? Let's put some of the main um, attractions of the Fiesta, and there are many. It's a packed weekend. First of all, we have the altar where St. Peter's at the center, and that is really the center of the Fiesta. We have the carnival, which everybody loves. Here's the Ferris wheel. There's angels in the sky. We have the same boat races. And oh, there's the East Greasy Pole. We'll get into that soon. And of course, we've got the fishing boats coming in. So let's get started. If you're looking down, I guess I'm going to start on this page. Here are some clues in early June when you begin to see signs that the fiesta is going to come. The fiesta is only scheduled the last weekend in June, June 29th, which is closest to the feast day of St. Peter. You will see uh, little sailor suits in the children's store downtown. This, this store has since closed, but you will see children dressed up in their sailor suits during the fiesta. Most everybody else wears white dresses or white pants. If you look down towards the uh, St. Peter's Square, a few weeks before uh, the fiesta, you will see this marvelous altar being set up. The trucks come in and I don't know how they do it, but they set up this beautiful altar. And you go by every day, you'll see more and more being set up. And then they put the angels in the sky. Well, things are getting more exciting as the days go on. Nine days before the fiesta, there's a series of special prayers. It is held for nine evenings before the fiesta. Men, women, and children gather at the American Legion Hall to sing prayers together in the Sicilian dialect that they learn from their grandparents. They thank, they thank St. Peter for keeping the fishermen safe. As night falls, you can begin to see the Ferris wheel lights. Everything is being set up. You can see the food booths, sugar babies, candy apples, frozen slush, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things. And if you look out in the harbor, you can see the fishing boats coming in. The fishing boats arrive for St. Peter's Fiesta. They're home for seven days, a whole week. It is a wonderful time for the families to get together. The fishermen also paint their boats and they decorate them to get ready for the blessing of the fleet, which comes on Sundays. And they take part also in thanking St. Peter for watching over them and guarding them and keeping them safe. Oh, another thing that happens weeks before the fiesta, practically the whole month, everybody begins just to bake something and to think about what they're going to have on the Sunday of the fiesta. Some people, would you believe, have over 350 people come to their yard for a, a, a meal. They, they entertain aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, neighbors, friends, and greasy pole walkers. Anyone that comes by is welcome. Uh, some of the meals could be Italian sausage, fried fish, calamari. You might have S cookies. And we talked about trans, uh, traditions. An S cookie is a trans dish, a tradition at the fiesta and all kinds of Italian cookies that you can enjoy. The ninth day of the, of the uh, uh, novenas is an even bigger night when even more people come to the American Legion Hall. Um, a priest comes at that time and offers a message of thanksgiving and hope. And at that time, everyone is handed, here we are, the St. Peter's button to commemorate St. Peter. He's always there right on the button. And everyone is given a delicious piece of cassata cake, which is made with um, sponge cake, uh, um, custard, and lots 
of uh, whipped cream. You'll really enjoy that. So it, it's held up, upstairs in, in on the American Legion Hall. So after this, you go downstairs and wait for the people to bring St. Peter down. You'll see here he's put on a platform and night is falling and things are getting very, very exciting because the, the opening of the fiesta is almost coming. So people walk around the, uh, and proceed with St. Peter around the American Legion Hall there and then bring him down to St. Peter's Club. Now here's the big night. Uh, when you come to the, the opening, you can join a procession uh, with a candle. You meet at St. Peter's Club where, where St. Peter's in the window there. They take St. Peter, put him on a platform and everyone walks him silently to the altar where he is, stays all weekend. All the children are given out huge tubes of confetti and uh, they can wave American flags. Make believe you're, you're throwing the confetti now. It's all over the place at this point. Sometimes they shoot it out of the cannon uh, and the mayor comes and welcomes everybody to the fiesta. Viva, she says, viva. You're gonna hear a lot of that word, viva. Viva San Pietro. Can you say that now? Viva. Everybody is shouting. The fiesta has begun. Oh boy, Saturday. This is really a day for the children. Here the children are, uh, it's a pie eating contest. How would you like to put your face in a pie and try to eat it before the other person? Or you can go to the watermelon contest. It's all there on um, beach court. Uh, or you could throw an egg. Have you ever been in an egg, egg throwing contest? I wouldn't try it in your house, but you could try it in the driveway. A lot of yolks you're gonna find on the driveway when you finish. And on Sunday, don't miss the piñata. Uh, when I went to see the piñata one year, I saw so much candy. It's more than candy. You more candy than you even get at, at Halloween. It's a wonderful time. As the weekend proceeds, this is Saturday now, and probably Friday night too. You'll see the rides and the carnival. You could go on the merry-go-round, the Arctic Blast, and many other round rides. You could um, play the duck game or throw a, throw a, a dart at a balloon and get a nice prize. Uh, and don't forget the food. You, get, you could eat the fried dough, the powdered sugar, cotton candy, cotton apples, uh, I mean candy apples. And don't forget Amy's, uh, Amby's famous sausage. So it's quite a day of eating and riding and playing games at the carnival. On Sunday morning, the carnival goes silent for a while because it is time for the outdoor mass. I wouldn't miss this either. Everybody is outdoors and the cardinal comes from Boston and the Gloucester girls and boys who are altar boys and girls come and proceed in with him for a mass. And you'll sing a wonderful song called Lord, you have come to the seaside. After, after the mass, a, a little time, a little time after that, you'll see uh, the procession, which is really one of the main events of the, of the fiesta. Children are, are, are holding up a, a sign of St. Peter, all made with flowers. And behind them, you'll see, this, see the center of procession which is of course uh, St. Peter and he's all decorated with flowers and caught and held on the shoulders. It's, he is about 800, uh, 600 pounds. So he's held on the shoulder of many men. And he, he is in the procession goes around town for about an hour, hour and a half maybe. Children often are on floats. Here's a float with a boat. Um, many, many children and sometimes over a hundred children carry the oars honoring the boats from the past in the boats right now. You'll hear many, many bands. It's, it's a wonderful parade uh, and you'll have a wonderful time. When the parade is over, the day has still not ended. You can go down to the De Stacy Boulevard at three o'clock and this is very special too. The fishing boats are decorated for the blessing from the Cardinal of Boston. And apparently in the old days there are hundreds and hundreds of boats out there, not so many now, but you, but, but the blessing is a very important. They remember the boats of long ago and the people pray to keep the fishermen safe. 
Not much long after that, you go down to Pavilion Beach and all the seine boats are set up. There are three seine boats that, are, that race. Now, these are very heavy boats. If you imagine there's 12 people at the boat rowing at the same time. Can you imagine, you can, you can kind of imagine or make believe you're rowing this heavy boat, the Nina Pinta and the Santa Maria. You have 12, 10, 10 rowers, uh, um, a helmsman in front who steers, see that long stick, and another person in front trying to keep the rowers together. The, the, one, the rowers that stay together the most are probably the ones that win. And do you see something out here? That is, of course, the Greasy Pole. Everybody knows the Greasy Pole. But before we get into that, the first place winner gets an American flag and the second, pay, <laughs> second place winner is awarded an Italian flag. And here we go to the Greasy Pole. I'm sure many of you have seen the Greasy Pole right off of Stacy Boulevard. It's there all year, but it really livens up on St. Peter's Fiesta. It's a very, very big event. You can see the um, harbor master out there because people have to uh, walk along this greasy pole and not fall into the ocean. They say that it, there's a lot of grease on there and there's even banana, banana peels. Can you imagine? Some people say there's fruit cocktail and Tabasco on there. I don't know if that's true, but it's very, very slippery and not too many people get to the end of it. Uh, so you'll see uh, men dressed up in funny costumes, taking a boat out, taking a uh, uh, climbing the ladder up here and waiting for their turn. So you can watch them, but you, not too many get th this far in the, in the cold water. I don't know if you want to do this or not, but it's people do it. And uh, the first time around, you're not allowed to get the flag. The second time around, you try and you try and you try to get the flag and you end up in the ocean many times and then get back up and try again. Finally, somebody finally gets the flag uh, and drops in the ocean, swims to the side, and people put them on their shoulder and go, viva, viva, here's the winner of the greasy pole. I'm gonna read this part uh, because it's kind of emotional because the weekend of St. Peter's Fiesta is drawing to a close for another year Night falls, bands play and people dance. The night is musical with sparkling lights and angels in the sky. At 11 o'clock, and maybe you could stay up to 11 o'clock, the men take St. Peter's statue from the altar. You could follow St. Peter's procession around the Fort neighborhood. Along the route, some people throw confetti from the windows of their homes. You can see the glow of the fireworks, and the distance and the golden lights in the, in the harbor. As the procession, procession reaches St. Peter's Square, the lights of the Ferris wheel and the angels sparkle in the sky. St. Peter's statue is taken to St. Peter's Club. He is carefully taken off the platform and carried inside. Everyone is shouting, Viva, 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 St. Pietro. And everyone sings, God bless America. St. Peter's Fiesta is over now until next year. And here's St. Peter in St. Peter's Club. But we, when you begin to see the sailor suits and dresses appear in the ch children's store downtown, when you see the men arrive to set up the altar, when you see the sparkling Ferris wheel and the angels in the sky, when the weather gets warmer and school is almost out, the Fiesta is coming again to Gloucester, Massachusetts passed down from one generation to the next. I'd like to hope that this book inspires you to think about traditions at the fiesta in your family, or just to traditions that you may have in your family and other events, like let's say a flag cake for 4th of July. And maybe you could sit down and make some drawings. People say to me, what could I draw? Well, there's lots of drawings in the fiesta in Gloucester itself. There's so much to draw there. And I hope that another thing you'll do is if you want to go and see this St. Peter's statue, he is there all year in the window of St. Peter's Club on Roger Street. So go over and take a look and say hi to St. Peter and thank him for keeping the fishermen safe. Thank you and have a good school vacation. Thank you, Alice.
That was a wonderful story about St. Peter's Fiesta. There are lots of things I didn't know, and I've been going for years and years and years. Well, the next person up is Peter Burkrot, who has an incredible voice, which you're going to hear. And he's going to read the legend of the Gloucester Sea Serpent. It's a story that might be a little scary at times, but they really believe that there was a sea serpent in Gloucester Harbor. So take it away, Peter. Hello, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Um, this uh, book, which I'm gonna to read to you is called, The Serpent Came to Gloucester. And just like the other two books we saw this morning, Moxie the Doxy and St. Peter's Fiesta, Gloucester is a very interesting place. We don't have to make up stories about Gloucester because there's so many true stories about Gloucester that are more interesting than what might come from your imagination, although I bet you have a good imagination. So <clears throat> this book is called The Serpent Who Came to Gloucester. It's written by M.T. Anderson with beautiful paintings by Bagram Ibatulin. And I'm going to first show you a picture and then you'll see who's telling the story. But what I wanna tell you as we start is that this happened in Gloucester. So if you look out your window, if you can see the ocean or down to the ocean, and if you could see through time, 205 years ago, you would be in Gloucester Harbor in 1817 when this actually happened. And I'll show you the pictures as I go, but first I wanna show you this beautiful painting. And the little boy who's standing there with his mother is the little boy who is telling the story. It was on a day when the sun was bright, when limpets were thick on the rocks, when the seagulls would squawk and would talk and would fight for the fish laid to dry on the docks. It was on a day when we washed all our clothes, when we hung them to dry on the frame of a little rowboat that would soon be mine. It was on that day that the serpent came. It came from the sea, from the lonely sea. It came from the glittering sea. I looked down the shore at the water's edge while hanging my smock out to dry and saw past the ridge of the rocky old ledge where the moss met the stones and the sky, the shimmer of ripples, the whip of a tail, the loops of a beast from the deep, my mother drew breath and looked paler than death. I dropped all my socks in a heap and it sank in the sea, in the sunny sea. It sank in the summertime sea. And here it is, this beautiful pink. And there's Gloucester. And there's the serpent that went swimming out in the bay. I ran to the town, to the Gloucester town. I yelled, get your spy glasses out. We just saw a serpent. We watched it sink down. I sped to the dark side to shout. I sped to the dark side to shout my big news. They told me to get on inside. Yes, we've seen the beast. We beg you, at least climb under something and hide from that thing in the sea in the dangerous sea, in the wide and the terrible sea. And here he is, running through Gloucester, shouting at all the people, come look down to the dock. <gasps> the terrified townspeople asked, is it there? They asked, has the beast got away? I looked down the lane past the island where the schooners lay out in the bay. The serpent was twirling, just chasing its tail and showed all intention of staying. Is it back in the deep? Is it eating our sheep? I think I said that the serpent is playing. 
it plays in the sea, in the frothy sea. It plays in the wobbling sea. And look at that little fella getting all the attention from all those worried people. They're gonna come and eat their sheep. It played there all day while we watched it from boats. It played there the next day in rain. It looked like a line of slippery floats that swam and then sunk in the main. It slithered and slid in the bay for a week and haunted the islands and coves. And people surprised it asleep on the shore and they went out to watch it in droves as it swam in the sea, in the lovely sea, as it swam in that ancient old sea. Here's Gloucester, without the bridge and the cell phones, just waiting, looking at the beast, playing in the bay. <clears throat> ah. In distant cities and towns, they soon heard of our beast and its tail and its maw. Zoologists living in Boston sent word that they wished us to write what they saw. They wished us to write what we saw, they said. We saw it by day and by night. We stood on the dunes as it danced in the moon and it swam black skinned in the silver light as it danced and writhed in the lonely sea, as it danced in the wide frosted sea. There it is, just like last night or the night before, we had a full moon only we didn't, I hope, have Cecil the sea serpent out there. When it left, we were sorry and sulked. We sat on the piers and the docks as the haddock were caught and the boats were caulked. We looked for the beast from our widow's walks. But the autumn came first and the winter came next and the serpent was not to be seen. It will be back, my mother said, when the eel grass is once again green. Oh, it will be back, my love, from the sea. It will be back from the icy cold sea. And I think we all know what Gloucester looks like in the winter, even now it looks a lot like it did 205 years ago. You can feel that. Oh. Hold on to your tri-cornered hats, it's about to get serious. But the next year, the men came with rifles. They came with their peg legs and knives. They vowed they would drown or would stab or would stifle the beast if it cost them their lives. If it cost them their lives, they would catch it by net or by hook or by crook. They stumped down the lane singing tilling songs and lifted their patches to squint and to look far out to the sea, to the lonely sea, to the murdy, murky, murky and murderous sea. This is called what we call toxic masculinity now. That's a bunch of pirates who decided they're gonna go down and kill something. Or maybe they're trying to protect their families, we don't know. But there they are, let's get a good look at them again. All the men, they're gonna go find that serpent and tell them who's boss. At the murky and murderous sea, they stared and they hunted its waters and ships and their hooks and harpoons were glinting and bare with sinister, dazzling tips. They hunted the sea for the serpent. I rode in the wake of their whaler, and I whispered, beast, sink, stay down in the drink. But I heard the cry of a sailor, there on the sea, on the lovely sea, I spy the beast on the bounteous sea. And look at the beautiful boat they're out in, looking for the serpent. He 
pointed his finger. They grabbed their harpoons. They cast off to chase it in boats. They rode to the rhythm of squid killing tunes with their bait in their boots and their boats. They rode and they crowed and they hollered. They swore and they threw their sharp spears. I saw the red spray and they turned away, but still I could hear the huzzas and cheers where they sat on the sea, on the dismal sea, near the blood on the wide dismal sea. Look at them going out, getting off the, giant, the schooner to go out in boats to hunt the beast. It pulled them left and it pulled them right. It pulled them up and down. It tugged them through day and it hauled them through night and they feared they would lose it or drown. But at last it gave up its struggle. They reeled in the rope with their hands with grins they did gloat as they grounded their boat and they laid their catch, their fresh catch on the sand by the side of the sea, the ebbing sea, by the side of the gray vacant sea. They are sailing through day and night, trying to keep their hold on the serpent. It was not a serpent they saw with a start. Nothing had gone as they'd wished. They turned their backs with a heavy heart they had landed a pretty big fish. I thought surely, protested the captain. We brought it to bay on the strand. But there, with its fins and its grimaced and grin, a mackerel lay limp in the sand. Pulled out of the sea, the shifty sea, the shifty and tricky salt sea. And there are all the men standing around talking about what the heck, and there's the fish they caught. Not quite a sea serpent. Well, the sailors, their faces gone gray and weary, rowed out to their ships, well defeated. We waited while mariners, frowning and weary, unfurled sails and halyards were cleated. And when they had gone and their sails were small, I rode with the fishermen far past Lob Lolly Cove and Norman's Woe to the place where the sea serpents are. And we watched them play in that lonely sea. They twirled in the thundering sea. There they are, right out the window, looking at the serpents playing out near Norman's Woe. And now I'm going to show you this page because our little boy looks like he might now be an old man and he's telling the story to maybe a little girl. It has been many years since I was a child and I cannot see well or sing. So I sit by the stove when the storms are wild and I think of childhood things. The steamships now plow through the waters. The forests have been felled by men. It has been years since the serpent appeared and I fear it will not come again, my love. Though I hope you shall see it. I fear it is gone and I fear it will not come again, my love. From the ancient and wrinkled old sea my love, from the ancient and wrinkled old sea. Thank you, Peter. Thank you Thank very you. much. That was excellent. Thank really, you. Uh, it gave me chills. <laughs> well, me too. <laughs> um, and now um, I want, would like to introduce uh, Lee Bolzer from, uh, and, and her company, Through Me to You Puppetry. 
uh, and she and they invite you to join Newton and his friends for a story time that will be fun as they read Caps for Sale. So uh, turn it over Thanks. to you, Lee, or Newton. Thanks, Sandy. Okay. Yeah, uh, you can't ask my mom for anything. She's so unreliable, but I'm here. All right, Newton, all right. <laughs> hey, kids, how you doing? I just want to do a quick shout out to my friends, Maggie and Thomas in the audience and Sherman. Hi, and anybody else that's joining us today for the first time. It's so great to meet you. Um, I was ex inspired to wear my cap, although it's kind of falling off. Mom, you might have to take my cap off. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it off, Newton. Oh, dear, there go my glasses. I was wearing, hold them up, Mom, please, my nice blue glasses. All those stories about Gloucester and the sea and whales and serpents, they inspired me to wear my special blue glasses. But, but uh, yeah, it's hard for me to read the book with my glasses on. So <laughs> you'll just have to use your imagination, kids, that I'm still wearing my, my spectacles. <laughs> All right, Newton, what are we going to read today? Oh, ah, this is one of my favorite books. This is called Caps for Sale, a tale of a peddler up there in the tree. Some, yeah, a peddler. He's a, he's a man who sells things, not like a peddler who rides a bike, not that kind of peddler. <laughs> so he's a peddler, some monkeys, do you see any monkeys? I didn't see them for the longest time. See if you notice them. I think they're hiding, hiding behind something. Ahem, ahem. <laughs> monkeys and their monkey business. Uh, this is told and illustrated by Esfer Slobokina. And mom, could you just, there we go, reframe the book. Thank you. Here we go. Caps for sale. Okay, you can move that over a little. There we go. Once there was a peddler who sold caps, but he was not like an ordinary peddler wearing his wares on his back. Mm -mm. He carried them on top of his head, as you can see. <laughs> First he had his own checked cap, then a bunch of gray caps, then a bunch of brown caps, then a bunch of blue caps, and then on the very top, a bunch of red caps. There you go. What an odd way to carry his wares. He must have got a lot of attention. Well, he walked up the streets and down the streets, holding himself very straight so as not to upset his caps like this. Very straight, very slow. And as he went along, he called caps, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap. Mom, what's happening? <laughs> Sorry, their book is falling down. 50 cents a cap. Mm, sorry about that, Newton. Oh my goodness gracious. Here we go. One morning, he couldn't sell any caps. Oh, that's sad. He walked up the street and he walked down the street calling caps, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap. But nobody wanted any caps that morning. Not even a red cap. Aw. Well, he began to feel very hungry. Mm-hmm. But he had no money for lunch. Oh, because oh, he didn't sell any caps. That's why. So he said, I think I'll go for a walk in the country, said he. And he walked out of town slowly, slowly, as to not upset his caps. You can imagine them on my head, huh, kids? Okay, Mom, turn the page carefully, please. <laughs> okay. He walked for a great long time until he came to a great big tree. Oh, that's a nice place for a rest, thought he. And he sat down very slowly under the tree and leaned back little by little so as uh, against the tree trunk so as not to disturb the caps on his head. 
Then he put up his hand to feel if they were straight. First, his own checked cap. Mm -hmm. Then the gray caps. Then the brown caps. Then the blue caps. And then the red caps on the very top. Yup, they were all there. So he went to sleep. Sorry, but this book is not cooperating with us today. He slept for a long time. Oh boy, the sun is up high. When he woke up, he felt refreshed and rested. Oh. Okay, we got our right-hand man here gonna help us with the book. Push the table back. But before standing up, he felt to make sure that his caps were all in the right place. Oh no! All he felt was his own checked cap. Oh no! Where'd they go? Okay, turn the page, thank you. Excellent. Well, he looked to the right of him. No caps. He looked to the left of him. No caps. He looked in back of him. No caps. He looked behind the tree. Nope. No caps. Then he looked up, up into the tree and what do you think he saw well on every branch sat a monkey <laughs> and on every monkey was a gray or a brown or a blue or a red cap <laughs> oh boy now here comes the monkey business kids well the peddler looked at the monkeys the monkeys looked at the peddler and he didn't know what to do. So finally, hmm, he spoke to them and he said, you, you, you monkeys, you, he said, shouting, a, shaking a finger at them. You give me back my caps. But the monkeys only shook their fingers back at him and said, tss, tss, tss. <laughs> Well, this made me laugh, but this made the peddler very angry. So he shook both hands at them and he said, You, you monkeys, you, you give me back my caps. But the monkeys only shook both their hands back at him and said, Oh, I think I'm seeing a pattern, kids, are you? Well, now he felt quite angry. He stamped his foot and he said, You, you monkeys, you, you give me back my caps. But the monkeys only stamped their feet back at him and said, you want to join in with me, kids? <laughs> I think they're copying him. Don't you? Monkey see, monkey do. Oh, boy. What's going to happen next? Well, by this time, the peddler was really very, very angry. And perhaps, oh, but the monkeys only stamped both their feet back at him and said, tss, tss, tss. Oh, those monkeys. He's running out of things to do. What's he going to do next? Well, at last he became so angry that he pulled off his own cap like this and threw it on the ground and began to walk away. Hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. 
But then each monkey pulled off his cap and all the gray caps and all the brown caps and all the blue caps and all the red caps came flying down out of the tree. Oh, there we go. He's getting his caps back, finally. I never thought that would happen. <laughs> so the peddler picked up his caps and put them back on his head. First, his own checked cap, then the gray caps, then the brown caps, then the blue caps, and then the red caps on the very top. And slowly, slowly, he walked back to town calling, Caps, caps for sale, 50 cents a cap. The end. Yay, caps for sale. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Paige Turner. We couldn't have done it without you. Sorry for our technical help, our technical uh, problems there at the beginning. And before we say goodbye, I just wanted to introduce my friend, um, Sam, Bam, Ham. If you wanted to come up and say hi to the kids real quick and sing a quick song. Sam, come on up. I, I think we still have a, another minute. Come on up, Sam. Oh, quick, quick. I'm coming. Oh, gosh, is my hair okay? I wasn't expecting a, an appearance today. Oh, boy. Is it all right, kids? How am I looking? Sam, why don't you fix your hair real quick? Excuse me, kids. Oh, gosh, I'm not camera ready. Excuse me. One second, I'll get my hair ready. There we go. Okay. Sam, would you like to sing a quick song with the children before we say goodbye? Yes, please. Okay. I would like to sing, um, uh, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yes, it's sort of like you can copy me just like the monkeys copied the peddler. So let's warm up real quick. Can you clap your hands? Clap, 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 clap. All right. Can you stomp your feet just like the peddler? Stomp, 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 stomp. Very good. And now, can you shout, hooray, hooray. All right, I can feel the energy, even if I can't hear you. Excellent, excellent. All right, on the count of three, you can sing along with me too, if you'd like. All right, one, two, three. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, clap, clap. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, clap, clap. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, clap, clap. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet, stomp, stomp. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet, stomp, stomp. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet, stomp, stomp. If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, shout hooray, hooray! <laughs> I'm happy now. I hope you are too. Enjoy the rest of our program, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And one last thing, if you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, I thought I would do a quick plug, Mom. Sure. Can you put it in the chat? Sure, there you go. There's a link if you want to sign up for our Through Me to You puppetry newsletter and learn more about our puppet programs. Well, thank you, Gloucester Meeting House. And thank you, Miss Sandy and Mr. Charles. Back to you. And thank you. What a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye, Mom, real quick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, kids. Mwah. Stay. We have more fun stories and songs. Same to you. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, those are pretty animated puppets, huh? wouldn't you say? So our next story is called Katie and the Big Snow. And it's going to be read by Pat Johnson, who's going to put the images that were made by a wonderful artist named Virginia Burton up on the screen for us. So Pat, take it away. Hello, everybody. Let me see if I can get there. Hello, everybody. 
and putting on my winter clothes because we're going to be reading a book about a big snowstorm and I'm going to put the book up for you to see right now. Okay, this book is called Katie and the Big Snow and was written and uh, designed and illustrated by Virginia Lee Burton, who was a Gloucester writer and a Gloucester illustrator who um, actually founded a wonderful group of people called the Folly Cove Designs back in the 1940s. Uh, lots of other illustrators and they did beautiful designs of things. Um, but she liked to write children's books, especially, and illustrate them. And this is one of her books, not there. She has lots of famous books, but this is one of the ones that's my favorite, especially because we just had a big snowstorm, didn't we? So this is, we, we can remember what it was like to have a snowstorm. You see how pretty the pages are. Katie was a beautiful red crawler tractor. She was very big and very strong, and she could do a lot of things. And you can see all the things that Katie can do in the drawings that Miss Burton has put all around the edge of the page like a frame. I was wondering why are all these horses here? And I think it's because that's how many horsepower Katie has. She's so strong, she has 55 horsepower, but she can do all kinds of things from, well, there's all these descriptions of what she can do. She can do things in the city and she can do things in the snow. She had a bulldozer to push dirt around with, and she also had a snow plow to plow snow with. And you can see her around the edges of the left-hand picture, digging dirt, but then in the right, when the snow falls, she puts on her snow plow and gets to work. Katie belonged to the highway department of the city of Geopolis. And this is our picture of the highway department. The highway department repaired the roads in the summer and kept them clear of snow in the winter. So traffic could run in and around the city. And this is the same thing that we see in Gloucester. All those potholes that happened in the summer, they winter, they fix them in the summer. And then when the snow comes in the winter, the plows come and plow the roads. Now around this page, all these drawings are of the different kinds of trucks that they have in a highway department for a city. Five ton trucks, 10 ton trucks, pickup trucks, sidewalk plows, cement mixers, Steam rollers? I don't think we have steam rollers anymore. A lot of these are from the 1940s and when they still had steam engines working for some of these jobs. Now everything is gas. Snow shovels and stone crushers. So these are all of Katie's friends at the highway department. And this is a map of the city of Geopolis. This is a really big city. So you can see that they need a big highway department to take care of all of this. All around the frame of this picture, Ms. Burton has drawn all the things that you can find in a town. City hall, high school, churches, the electric company, a chicken farm, a hospital, a fire department, lumber company, grain company. So if you buy this book or if you check it out, I had this book checked out by the way, on an application called Hoopla from the Sawyer Library, from our own Sawyer Free Library in Gloucester, you can get borrow an ebook version of many, many, many books using this app called Hoopla Digital. And that's how I borrowed this book. And you can put it up on your screen and see all these wonderful pictures. Um, there's even a nice house, just like Gloucester has. All summer, Katie worked on the roads with her bulldozer. Katie liked to work. The harder and tougher the job, the better she liked it. There she is in a construction zone there with using the there's dump truck. She's pushing the dirt. The dump trucks are dumping the dirt and then she's pushing the dirt away. Once when the steamroller fell in the pond, Katie pulled it out. 
The highway department was very proud of her. They used to say, nothing can stop her. She's the strongest machine they have in the highway department. When winter came, they put snow plows on the big trucks and they changed Katie's bulldozer for her snow plow. Because remember, she's actually not a truck. She's a, she's a tractor. Um, but the big trucks have to put on their snow plows too to plow the roads. So there they are putting on their plows and plowing the roads. But Katie was so big and strong, she had to stay at home. There really wasn't enough snow for her to plow. So the smaller plows took care of the snowstorms that weren't so very big. When would Katie be able to plow? Early one morning, it started to drizzle. The drizzle turned to rain. The rain turned into snow. By noon, it was four inches deep. The highway department sent out all the truck plows. There they go, there are the green trucks there in the picture. By afternoon, 10 inches deep and still coming down. Looks like a big snow, as they said at the highway department. It's time to send out Katie. A strong wind came up and you know how that happens in Gloucester. That happened during the last snowstorm. Remember the wind? Oh, it was really something. And drifts began to form one foot, two feet, three feet, five feet. The snow reached the first story windows, the second story windows, and then it finally stopped one by one. The truck snow plows broke down. The roads were blocked. No traffic could move. The schools, the stores, the factories were all closed. The railroad station and the airport were snowed in. The mail couldn't go through. The police couldn't protect the city. The telephone and power lines were down. There was a break in the water main. The doctor couldn't get to his patients in the hospital. The fire department was helpless. Everyone and everything was stopped but Katie. There's Katie. Chug, 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 chug. The city of Geopolis is there on the right, represented by a white screen because it's completely covered with a thick blanket of snow. Slowly and steadily, Katie started to plow out the city. Help, called the chief of police. Help us get out and protect the city. Sure, Katie said. Follow me. So Katie plowed out the center of the city. Big path all around. Help, called out the postmaster. Help us get the mail through. Sure, said Katie, follow me. There she is in the lower right in front of the post office. So Katie plowed all the way down from the post office to around and up to the railway station. Help, help, cried the telephone company and the electric company. The poles are down somewhere in East Geopolis. Follow me, said Katie. And so she plows out the roads to East Geopolis. And as she goes, the green trucks follow behind her and put the telephone and electric poles back up where they belong. Help, called the superintendent of the water department. There's a break in the water main somewhere in North Geopolis. Follow me, said Katie. And she plowed out the roads to North Geopolis, all the way up from your left corner, past all those people that are shoveling around by the water tower and all the way back around. Help, emergency, called the doctor. 
Help me get this patient to the hospital way out in West Geopolis. Okay, said Katie, follow me. So Katie plowed out all the roads to the hospital. You can see it goes up and up and up. Up in the upper left-hand corner is where the hospital is, is, is located. And behind her come all the trucks that she's plowed a path for, including, I hope, the doctor. Help, 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 called out the fire chief. There's a three alarm fire way out in South Geopolis. Follow me, said Katie. So Katie plowed out the roads to the fire in South Geopolis, up and down and all around. Look at that house on fire down there. Thank goodness the fire department's getting there. On the way back, a plane signaled for help. <laughs> a plane? The airport was snowed in. Katie was beginning to get just a little bit tired, but she wouldn't stop. Not our Katie. And so she hurried over to the airport and plowed out the runways so the airplane could land safely. Then, after she had found all those broken down truck plows, she started home. The fire department had put out the fire. The doctor had saved his patient. The water department had repaired the water main. The telephone and the electricity were back on. The mail could go through and the police could protect the city. Thanks to what Katie did. There it is, Geopolis again, but all plowed out and ready for business. Katie finished up the side streets so that traffic could move in and out of the neighborhoods, and then she went home for a rest. Then and only then did Katie stop. Chug, chug, chug goes Katie. You can see the guys at the door of the highway department are cheering. Yay, Katie. Thank goodness for Katie. She saved the day. And that's the story of Katie, the tractor and her snowplow and Katie and the big snow. And all I can say is I wish we had a Katie here in Gloucester. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the book. Thank you, Pat. That was wonderful. What a great story. I wish we had a Katie too in Gloucester because we've been stuck here many times with the poles down and the telephone gone and sitting around the wood stove wondering how long we were gonna be able to hang out. Well, our last part of our show today is Corey Wynn, who's going to be singing some original sea shanties, and he's going to ask you to sing along if you like. And there he is. So, Corey, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, so we've heard so much about uh, Gloucester and how amazing it is. And Gloucester has such a rich history in myth with the sea serpent and its celebrations with St. Peter and with sailing and its maritime involvements like we heard from daisy uh, stan in maritime gloucester and i wrote a few sea shanties i'd love to share with you all that are about the rich history of gloucester and gloucester is one of the oldest it's the oldest seaport in the united states and is one of the oldest seaports in north america in fact, so we go back, we go way back. Um, and this song I'm going to sing is about the fishermen that sailed out from Gloucester to uh, out into the Atlantic Ocean to go find halibut and cod and uh, maybe some tuna. They were lucky. 
And this one is called the Docks of Old Gloucester. And maybe you can imagine yourself way back in the day, and you can smell all the fish on the docks. You can smell the, the smoky taverns. You can hear the creak of the lines. And maybe uh, you might see the serpent out there. Who knows? <laughs> You can imagine yourself rocking on the ocean. Um, I wrote that song about our very own schooner adventure, who is resting now um, very warm down at Maritime Gloucester. I'm getting ready for the 2022 season alongside Ardell and uh, I think Elizabeth. I think that's or the Isabella. That's, that's the other one down there. Um, Gloucester has such a rich history with fishing schooners and these old wooden boats have really provided us with the life we have today. If we didn't have these wooden boats and the people sailing them, um, trading with faraway lands, um, I don't know what our society would look like today. My next song for you all is called Roll and Go. It's um, a rocking and rolling song it's about a gentleman who found himself after a night on the town, found himself on a, uh, on a boat. He had no idea how he got there. And this is his journey through um, some crazy and stormy seas. <laughs> make, I gotta make sure I'm in the right key. <laughs> Uh, 
And I told him I declined I paid for that and for my son I got my fill of bride Roll and go Right, frigate ride I paid for that and for my son I got my fill of bride The captain put back Oops, that's the other one The sea made me go mad My son is mad as bad could be Shed tears and sweat and blood for fun from windward to the lee. Roll and go, ride, frigate ride. Shed tears and sweat and blood for fun from windward to the lee. Now here comes the storm. The storm had fenced and caught us blind and ripped our sails to shreds. The rocks go toes and out of our minds we surely wind up dead. Roll and go, ride, frigate ride. The rocks couch holes and all of our vines will surely wind up dead. I awoke this time to crash of waves and crying gulls above. God bless the sea and stars alike. I'm off to find me love. Roll and go. Right, frigate, right. I'm off to find my love at last. We can't day or night. By the end of that story, our sailor friend had escaped the boat he found himself on, and hopefully he didn't swim back home, but he found another way, a safer way back home, and avoided the storm. In my life, I've had the opportunities to sail on Schooner Adventure and another ship called the Corwith Kramer uh, down south with... Um, a bunch of other students. And we sailed into the Atlantic to a place where there were no lights around us and all we could see was the galaxy and the stars above. And it was so inspiring, that journey that we took. And I wrote a song about it with a friend. And this chorus is a bit easier to sing along to. Uh, we'll come across it many times. But with every wooden boat, fishing boat, any boat that goes overnight trips, you have to stand watch to make sure that you don't bump into anything. Maybe you see the serpent out there and you have to alert the captain. But to stand watch is a very important job for sailors. It just keeps everyone safe and it's a good thing to stay awake at the middle of the night. So this song is called My Watch Has Begun. <laughs> And it talks about our experience there where we were rolling in the waves. Some of us were getting seasick and we were feeding the fishes. Uh, other times we were sailing into uh, a seaweed ocean. We didn't know, we had to stop all the engines because we couldn't get the seaweed in the engine. So it's some fun lyrics. <laughs> has begun with the setting of the sun. There's nothing between me and the deep blue sea, except the stars on high to navigate by, and a tall ship with her sails unfurled. My captain, he is salty as the sea, his hands run the rigging with ease. When the winds pick up, he says, look up. The spray will knock you to your knees. My watch has begun with the setting of the sun. 
There's nothing between me and the deep blue sea. Set the stars on high to navigate by. And our ship with the sails unfurled. Me mates and I sail full and by. In fear to the Sargasso Sea. Where the lizard men there will take us to their lair. Down in the depths of the deep. The rolling waves had coral caves, rocking the ship to and fro. And over the side, the fish we might hide to see our stomachs outflow. This comes of course. My watch has begun with the setting of the sun. There's nothing between me and the deep blue sea. Set the stars on high to navigate by, and a tall ship with her sails unfurled. I whistled one more into my forlorn. The winds began howling aloft. So jealous and free, a mistress is she. The only can sing so soft. And with her gust, we had to bust. To get back to port, we rode those trades, great distance we made to where our ship she makes burn. My watch has begun with the setting of the sun. There's nothing between me and the deep blue sea, except the stars on high to navigate by, and all ship with the sails unfurled. And now that we're done. We had our fun out on the open sea. We say our goodbyes, but within our eyes, I know we'll be back here one day. My watch has begun with the setting of the sun. There's nothing between me and the deep blue sea. Some stars on high to navigate by, and a tall ship with the sails unfurled. Together, my watch has begun with the setting of the sun. There's nothing between me and the deep blue sea. Some stars and high to navigate by, and a tall ship with the sails unfurled. Thanks for singing along, everyone. We had fun. And thank you so much, Gloucester Meeting House, for having us all um, share our talents and our knowledge. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and yes, thank you, everybody. This was a really great afternoon. Yes. And I hope some of you enjoyed the pizza from Sebastian's. I, we saw that quite a few of you got a $10 discount and went over there. And I saw some of you eating as well. <laughs> um, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourselves if you like. And you can um, all unmute and say something or, or not. So you can just use that little microphone down to the left if you want to unmute yourself. And we've been thrilled to have you here today. Thank you for having us. Did you have a good time? Mm -hmm. Good. I read it. <laughs> cool. Good. You like the reading, Thomas? You like the reading? Yeah. Oh, good. And I am in kindergarten because I'm a full fifth grade. Wow. Oh, very. Wow. And what do you think of that puppet? Good. Oh, Thomas is my friend. We go way back, don't we, Thomas? And Maggie, you come to a lot of our Zooms. I'm so glad you could make this yes. one. I've missed seeing you. And so good to fuck. No, I can't hear you. We have moved in taxi now. We had to pack him move to taxi. You what now? We had to pack him move to taxi and that was really odd. Yeah, we're in Texas, but Thomas and oh. I live in Gloucester, so. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
Mm -hmm. So glad well, you can join from Bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. We're so glad you could join us, everybody. And we hope next time we can do it all together at the meeting house. But this is what we got. And we're so <laughs> glad that we all had a good time together. So have a great weekend and great school vacation. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. So much fun. <laughs> Bye, Newton. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Newton. Thank you. Thanks.